Look, first, I genuinely want to commend both of you and the other sponsors for, for, for putting this on, because I don't believe this has really been done primarily for commercial reasons, but genuinely for educational ones. And what I am really going to commend is the fundamental message. This has been a very disjointed industry. It's really failed to get the message across. And this is an opportunity to build something really fresh, something new. And I don't believe we've ever had a, a better time to do it. If last night was largely about a technical issue, what I want to focus on in, in my talk today is politics. Because politics is really at, at the heart of this. Ever since I became involved in fire safety about, well, it's more than 20 years ago now, there has never been more political leverage than there is now. We all knew that Grenfell would happen. We just didn't know when, we didn't know where, and we couldn't in our wildest dreams have imagined that so many people would be killed in one go. But we all knew that two or three hundred people died every year in house fires in England and Wales. The problem up to Grenfell is that the victims weren't very political. They died in ones or twos and threes, so they didn't make the headlines. And if you don't make the headlines, you don't make the political agenda. And if you don't make the political agenda, very little gets to happen. Now that 71 people have died, and look, even Lackanel House, what was that, six dead? I think 20 seriously injured, even that didn't really shift the political firmament, the tectonic plates, but 71 dead. And in that spectacular way, appalling way that it happened, if you guys cannot pull the levers now, then heaven help us all. As Stuart has said, we need one voice. There are so many other industries which were disparate. And I was talking earlier on outside about the travelers, travel and tourism industry. You might not know it's one of the biggest industries in the world. It creates one in five of all new jobs. But people didn't know that until the industry began to get together. All the companies, whether they're hotels, whether they're airlines, whether they're airports, whether they're the credit card companies that facilitate this, the financial services, all the rest of them coming together and creating a real power block to make governments listen. And that's what you need to do. We need to get all our energies combined, all our energies so that we get leverage. And I'm going to commend to you that we go for the future and not for the past. I'm not looking for revenge, even if it's dressed up in that noble word, justice. You may remember the slogan, 71 dead and still no arrests, how come? That was the slogan of the Justice for Grenfell campaigners. Well, you can understand their anger, of course. It's human nature to want to seek out culprits. Psychologists call it the false attribution error. If I do something wrong, it's a mistake. Um, if you do something wrong, it's because you have bad character. If I'm speeding in my car, it's because I'm in a hurry. If you're speeding in a car, it's because you're an antisocial driver. That's just human nature. It's how we see things. It's true in the movies, of course. We, we love heroes and anti-heroes. We love the goodies and the baddies, the supermen versus the villainy, the cowboys versus the Indians. And it's true of disaster movies, too. In the 1974 movie, Towering Inferno, a high-rise firestorm was caused by a devious and corrupt contractor. Have you heard that story recently? And here we had a superhero, Paul Newman, who comes and rescues people trapped inside. Um, naturally, that is the narrative which is really taken up after Grenfell. But in real life and in real death, things are usually much more nuanced, much more complicated, and not easily solved by going for these movie-like heroics. The leaked interim report from the, from the BRE suggests a whole catalogue of faults. Among them, the window frames were too small, leaving a direct route for the fire spread around the window into the cavities of the facade and therefore back uh, into the flats. The cavity barriers had been fitted to stop this, but they were too small. And in fact, some were fitted upside down, some were fitted back to front. The result was a catastrophic chimney-like effect because you had a gap between the cladding and the concrete. As we all know, the external insulation was combustible, as was the aluminium composite that was used outside. And a lot more beside contributed to this calamity. Some of this was due to the recladding. Some of it was an accumulation of events that had happened over time, over years, perhaps over decades. There should have been a wet riser main rather than a dry one that relied on a pump from the fire engine downstairs. There should have been sprinklers. 
Now, the sprinkler issue, uh, as you've heard, is, is one I really think is crucial. And whatever the BRE has said so far, uh, maybe Nick Hunt and Steve Bingham can tell us more about this this afternoon. Sprinklers would almost certainly have put the fridge fire out, or at least have contained it, before it spread. Or at very least, washed down the fumes and the smoke and kept down the temperatures. They would have saved lives at very least. least. I suspect they would have saved every life in the building. And of course, although New uh, the, the Grenfell happened to be particularly robust, in a less robust building, they would have prevented the sort of collapse that we saw so spectacularly earlier this week in a high rise in Sao Paulo. Despite millions of applications around the world, for all intents and purposes, no one has ever died in a home protected by properly maintained sprinklers. They're roughly the same price as fitted carpets. They're almost impossible to trigger by accident. As I say, they almost always put the fire out before the firefighters arrive. They ca cause far less water damage than a, a firefighter's hose will put on in the first minute or two. I think it's true to say that even in commercial applications, hardly anybody has died in a property protected by sprinklers other than through structural collapse for other reasons, through flashovers or something which you couldn't possibly expect any active firefighting apparatus to prevent. Now, the BRE stuff is all interim. It's all leaked, so it may not be accurate in the first place. It's said to be only based on t four of the 24 stories uh, at, at Grenfell. So there's a lot more to come. But what we know already is that the implications go far, far beyond the tenant management organisation that was responsible for the refurb. They go far beyond Kensington and Chelsea Borough Council. They go far beyond the 500 contractors and the subcontractors, and far beyond even the tower itself. Now, most of you here are experts in this, and I'm, I'm very conscious I'm speaking to people who know a lot more about this stuff than, than I do. But you know that these failings, or failings like them, affect thousands of buildings, probably tens of thousands in this country, probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions, around the world. This is not unique to Grenfell, however much the police inquiry is going to focus, like a telescope, down on this one failing. We know that the same cladding has been used around the world. We've seen spectacular stuff on television of it catching fire in, in uh, other buildings around the world. One of them, one of the tallest buildings in, in the world. We know that building inspection is weak, uh, and we know that many windows are going to be ill-fitting, or cavity barriers have been wrongly installed or not properly installed in the first place. We know the local Tory council has been vilified, and I have absolutely no reason to want to defend them. But a couple of cross, uh, miles across London there, but for the grace of God, goes a Labour borough, the London borough of Camden. Five tower blocks, as you know, in the Chilcot estate had to be <coughs> evacuated and refurbished because, guess what? They had all the faults of Grenfell built into their refur refurbishments as well. So never mind the political choreography about this. I don't know whether you voted in the local elections or not today, but let all the propaganda about Grenfell for one side or the other not influence you over much. The Conservatives, on the one hand, trying to distance themselves from this, Labour, uh, and including, I'm sorry to say, Jeremy Corbyn, rather grandstanding on it. Grenfell is an issue where politics and politicians failed across the spectrum, and it's a national, not a local, shame and embarrassment. Long before the... Uh, hip-hop artist Stormzy or the Oscar-winning actress Frances McDormand became late converts to the cause of fire safety. It was almost impossible to get fire safety high on the national agenda. And the reason was a rather natural complacency. As you all know, fire deaths have been falling for decades uh, across the United Kingdom. We had fewer chip pans, fewer cigarettes, fewer oil stoves, fewer open fireplaces, better electrical safety, better... Uh, a furnishing which was more fire resistant and fewer fires had broken out. And with smoke detectors, more people had been alerted in time to escape. And the figures of that decline in, in mortality is abs are absolutely stunning. Fire deaths fell from 196 alone in London in 1980 to 199 across the whole of the United Kingdom in 2016. That is a staggering gain. It goes to prove really what the title of this talk is. These aren't accidents, they're consequences. We can drive them down. If they were just accidents, we should all be fatalistic, throw up our hands and say, oh, well, 
accidents happen. But because the gains had been so great, when campaigners urged reforms that would have prevented the deaths at Grenfell, they were shunned. So what would have prevented the deaths? Well, the first priority, of course, was to tighten up the building regulations and update approved document B. And, of course, even the most stringent and best thought out building regulations are only as good as they are properly inspected. Both of these reforms were rejected. We came up against a wall of ideology, a fashionable consensus against what was described and still is often described to some people by as red tape. I loathe that pejorative way of talking about making sure society is properly regulated. It was the same doctrinaire rejection of so-called nanny state that led to the banking crisis. Remember that? Remember the removal of restrictions about lending to subprime mortgages? Remember governments turning a blind eye to the banks as they took on more and more complex transactions like securitization that bypassed the, the, the regulatory structures? In the spirit of the age, it was known as light touch regulation. And look where that got us. And it wasn't just Reagan and Thatcher. It was Clinton, it was Gordon Brown. It was a fashion. And in financial services, it caused a conflagration that was global. The same approach was, approach, uh, was applied to fire protection. Red tape was said to be, and I quote, choking Britain. And I'm sure no irony was intended. It was the same for active fire protection, sprinklers. Again and again, year after year, I went to see the fire minister and they came in and went and came in and went. What was that phrase here today, gone tomorrow? Pressing for mandatory sprinklers in all social housing and in care homes. And again and again, regardless of whether the minister was Tory, Labour or coalition, I was sent away with, my, with a flea in my ear telling me it wasn't worth the candle. It wasn't just me. I went with fire experts. I could understand how one Tory minister said, what on earth is a broadcaster? think he's doing coming in here telling me what to do. But I went with fire chiefs. I went with people like you who knew what they were doing. In 2011, Wales became the first country in the world to mandate sprinklers for all new homes. And in Scotland, as you know, they're compulsory in all new care homes, sheltered housing schools and high rise flats. But England still disdains sprinklers on the grounds they'd impose an unnecessary burden on uh, homeowners and on social landlords. So. This is not an accident, this is a consequence. Now, if that's a designed consequence, and ministers say, yep, two, three hundred a year on average, that's fine with me. Fine, be honest about it. It may well be that that is an equation that in the scheme of things, given the tight finances, given you want more houses is acceptable. But don't pretend you are not involved in the equation. Don't just look for contractors, subcontractors and other people right down the line to blame when the blame goes all the way to the top, or at least the responsibility. I'm not too keen on blame. I think the story of Grenfell gets darker still because these Labour and Conservative politicians were all acting on advice. And that advice came from fire chiefs. I've been working with fire chiefs on fire safety for two decades, and uh, a handful of them persuaded me to take up the cause in the, fire, uh, in the first place. Many of them have been vigorous campaigners ever since. And given the extraordinary endurance and bravery of firefighters of all ranks, it doesn't come easily to criticise firefighters in any capacity at all. They are the real Paul Newmans. They do this stuff for real, not just on, on cellulose. So, um, I say this, and this is the second time I've, I've mentioned this. I said this at a fire summit a few months ago. I say this with a heavy heart, but I think it would be wrong to conceal it. Where were Britain's most senior fire officers when building regulations were allowed to go year after year after year without being updated? Where were Britain's fire chiefs when it was decided that we could have buildings inspection go out to the, the highest bidder? without anybody properly regulating how that was going on? Where, were the fire, where was the National Fire Chiefs Council on sprinklers? Apart from that weasel expression that they use, sprinklers may have some use in an overall fire safety strategy. I mean, come on. I think it's splendid now that more fire chiefs have come out and good for Danny Cotton now calling for sprinklers saying, this can't be optional, it can't be a nice thing to have, this is something that must happen. But if only that advice had been offered in unison by all her colleagues over the last few years or decades. 
As for the royal power of Kensington and Chelsea, I mean, frankly, it's hard to see how many other councils would have done better. Yes, there were rabbits in the headlights, but um, not one other council, as far as I'm aware, had challenged successive governments on anything to do with this. Did the specifiers and the contractors cut corners? Were the subcontractors culpable? Maybe. But if we go after them with criminal sanctions, will that help? I mean, let's face it, the Metropolitan Police report uh, is looking for culprits, fundamentally. 200 police officers committed to that. Can you imagine, for somebody like me who's concerned with real crime, incidentally, how much this is pulling resources from crimes that may affect you where people are trying to do you harm and maybe repeat offenders? but they will not even come out and investigate your crimes because so many of them go for these things which I think, frankly, are looking too far in the behind and not enough in the future. In aviation and increasingly in healthcare, we're increasingly aware that safety and blame can be inimical. They are opposed to one another. There's currently, for example, a huge row about junior doctors. Have any of you heard about Bauer Garber? Perhaps not, you're not in the medical professional, allied profession. A huge row among, if it had happened in the fire profession, you'd all absolutely know about it. Here you had this woman uh, who was a junior doctor, Hadiza Bawagaba, who was given a suspended prison sentence for um, gross, what was well, in, in effect for manslaughter, saying that uh, a child had died because she didn't uh, identify sepsis and she should have done. And colleagues are appalled, not just because this was a systemic failure, but because this goes against all the learnings of recent times. Do you remember uh, the, the mid-staffs affair? We had the Francis inquiry, and that was saying you've got to have a culture of openness and learning, you've got to do away with the blame culture. And still in medicine, they all know that, but they can't get away from the blame culture. They can't get away from the hierarchy. They can't get candor, even though it's required by some acts of, of parliament. What we need to do is put the patients first, and if you want to put patient safety first, you put blame at the end of the queue. And we've got to do this in fire safety as well. Um, you'll have your own view on whether to be punitive or not, but as uh, someone who's spent a lot of my time trying to put real villains in prison, as I say, um, I just warn that the police inquiry isn't going to bring anybody back to life. I don't even think even those who think they're going to get closure out of prosecutions will get a sense of closure. I don't think it's going to be as helpful sending someone to prison as it is concentrating on making sure we never let this happen again in future. And let's not, as I say, focus just on high-rise buildings. Um, for, all you, for all of you, I hope, know that low-rise buildings are, are very, very dangerous. Um, in the year before Grenfell, 196 of the 199 fire fatalities in England were in low-rise or medium-rise buildings. So let's keep the fire safety regulations up to date, let's get better building inspectors, but above all, let's get more and more sprinklers. We need the fire chiefs to get together, we need to go with uh, Danny Cotton, do what the National Fire Sprinkler Network has been campaigning about for ages, and above all, we need all of you to act as unisons. Architects are still amazingly Many, many of them ignorant about sprinklers. Many, many myths perpetuate about how I can bash them and the whole sprinklers uh, in, in the property will all go off at once and drench people. Uh, insurance companies are saying, oh, yeah, but you can get leaks from them. We're not, not sure about it. Never mind if people get killed. But we're very anxious about the, about the leaks you might get from them, which you shouldn't get if they're properly installed and properly maintained. As some of you know, 15 years ago I put up an idea for ultra-low-cost sprinklers which are based on just using the ordinary household plumbing without, without pumps. I had a row with some of you in the industry because you wanted to keep standards up. Though I'm saying there are two sorts of standards. One is where we have a duty to protect people, as in social housing, as in commercial properties, as in hotels. But another where we need to get it out to the great huge mass of, of ordinary housing and where you can do it cheaply, you don't need such high standards. But whatever it is, this is your moment. Please don't let it s slip through your fingers. Grasp this moment because I promise you the momentum will fade away. Sprinklers mandatory in all social housing, low build as well as high, high rise, mandatory in all care homes, and mandatory wherever we have a duty of care. If Wales can do it, we can do it. And I think the slogan needs to be at least make social tenants as safe as houses. Thank you.